Hello everybody, welcome for another episode of Mondays with Mate. We talked about batteries, about inverters, and the inverter is a part of a bigger system, which is the powertrain system. And today we are going to talk about that. We've chosen that topic based on your questions. So please keep these questions coming so we know what to talk about next. Today with me here I have Boris Danowski, who is our SA team leader in the vehicle engineering team for the powertrain development. Welcome, Hello. Boris. Thank you. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about how you came to this company? Well, I came a long time ago, so it's 2011, so nine years ago. Uh, I started, uh, with, we started together, and that's few first of a few of us, working on a concept one. Um, and after that, there were really a lot of other projects which we worked on. And in the end, I end up working on the C2, uh, developing the powertrain. Uh, fun fact, you were one of the first three guys I hired. Yeah. So we, we were starting and we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. So it was tough times because as soon as we started, we ran out of money, <laughs> uh, had super tight deadlines, didn't know what we were doing. Uh, so we had to learn a lot. So what is Misha just had an interesting idea. He proposed that we see who can say more facts about our powertrain in one minute. So okay. let's do that. Let's see, I'll go first. Three, two, one. Uh, four motors, uh, two inverters, liquid cooled, uh, rotor and stator, um, surface mounted permanent magnets, uh, 900 newton meters in the rear, 500 kilowatts on each side in the rear, uh, 5.8 transmission ratio. In the front, we have 220 kilowatts on each side and uh, 450 newton meters, uh, 450 amps RMS per side, 1000 amps RMS per side in the rear, uh, 48 kilograms per motor in the rear, 22 kilograms per motor in the front, 12 kilograms per gearbox in the front, 18 kilograms for the inverter in the front, 38 kilograms uh, for the rear inverter. Uh, 10,500 newton meters of torque on the rear axle. Uh, in total, 14,000 newton meters of torque on all four wheels or something like that. Um, 17,000. Time's up. Okay. <laughs> okay, Boris, now it's your turn. Three, two, one, go. Okay, so uh, four, uh, 680 kilograms of battery, uh, 8,000 something cells, uh, six, uh, 730 volts maximum voltage, 430 volts the low, lowest voltage. Um, coolant flow to the battery of 6 liters per minute, coolant flow to the uh, motors, uh, front motors 10 liters per minute, rear motors 15 liters per minute, uh, through the front inverters 40 liters per minute, uh, rear inverters uh, 60 liters per minute, uh, weight of the cooling system around 100 kilos for altogether, uh, coolant quantity in the complete car around a little less than 50 liters. Um, you still have 20 seconds to go. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, around more than 150 tubes in the vehicle with more than a lot of meters. I cannot remember the name, the exact number. Uh, and altogether, a complete power turn weight of around 1,100 something kilos. That's it. Thanks, Boris. This game was fun, but now let's talk about the axle. So here we have the front axle of the C2. I really like how it looks like with these capacitors here of the inverters, it looks a little bit like a V8 engine. So Boris, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, of course. So <clears throat> on top we have an uh, inverter, which is actually a double inverter, which uh, con controls both motors. It has a common cooling plate, which uh, in that way we managed to reduce the weight and uh, size of the inverter. In the, below the inverter we have two motors, one on each side, and in the middle we have connection box, which, control, which uh, distributes the cooling and connects to the inverter with the terminals. Uh, on each side we have the gearboxes with a uh, ratio of 5.8 and all together we have uh, the weight of the system is around 95 kilos, 440 kilowatts. So that's about 600 horsepower? Yes, around a little less than 600 horsepower and around 3000 uh, 3, newton meters on the wheels. On the front axle? On the front axle only. While in the rear we have? Much more. On the wheels we have around 10,000 something small. 10,500 newton meters. Can you explain why we have so much more torque on the rear than on the front? Uh, first, uh, there is weight distribution, so we have more weight on the rear, so we can transfer more torque on the wheels. And then and the second thing is because of dynamical weight transfer, again, we have more grip at the rear, 
because the car does this when it yes, accelerates, exactly. right? Accelerates and move the weight to the rear wheels more, and then again more grip, <laughs> so we can transfer more uh, more torque on the on the ground. So basically, the front and rear tires are both well beyond their uh, torque limits or yes. beyond their grip limits yeah. uh, until a certain speed. Yeah. So we can pretty much burn all four tires until a certain speed. Which is that certain speed? <laughs> it depends, right? Yeah. Yeah. But pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be able to drift with all four tires. That was that was one of the requirements we had from the beginning. It has to be fun. Has to burn rubber. Of course. We always said burn rubber, not gas. The front axle is cool, but the big gun is the rear axle. So let's yeah. go have a look there. Our frequent viewers will immediately recognize this. This is the inverter where we have a separate episode about. And if you didn't see that, click here. I always wanted to do that. Click here to see that episode. What I forgot to say in that episode is that this inverter has a name. It's called the BFI or the big flexible inverter. <laughs> really, that's the name. What's pretty fascinating for me is that here we have one megawatt of power or 1,300 horsepower basically, all in this little small package. All you need is to connect the battery and the communication and cooling lines and you have so much power. Yeah. yeah. And what we would usually have in, a, let's say, a normal car here where the output shafts are, would, here would be the differential. We don't have that. We have two separate gearboxes. So a lot of people are asking themselves, how does that work? Can you explain it a little bit? Yeah, of course. So uh, since uh, we are using remaster vectoring, we have to have a separate control of each wheel. Uh, we can control even one wheel in one direction, the other in the other direction, if you want. So what, let's say you go into a corner? In the corner, and then uh, inner, inner wheel will have uh, less torque, outer wheel will have more torque, of course, more speed, also speed. Be speed because of the uh, corner. So the same thing is when you drift, you can also have different distributions, so to have better drift. So you are controlling the speed of the motor or torque of the motor? We are controlling the torque and the speed is the result of the vehicle speed, of course, if you don't uh, burn tires. But maybe one thing that many people ask often, and that's maybe not natural to understand, even if you don't have any control, if you just send torque to the motors, the same torque to both motors, you can go through a corner. It's not going to be like a locked differential because the motors are independent, the gearboxes are independent, and when you go through a corner, the uh, resistance, the natural resistance of driving the car with different radiuses uh, of the left and right tire enables you to just um, pass the, the corner normally without any, let's say, uh, tension in the, in the system. If you would be controlling the motors with speed and not with torque, then you would have a problem and you would need to control it precisely. But as far as I know, no car controls the motors with speed, but with torque. One other thing I just love in general, but especially here, is different manufacturing technologies. So here we have structural carbon fiber. This is actually bolting straight to the monocoque. Then we have machined uh, aluminum, which we machine in our CNC machines. Here we have a casted gearbox housing that's machined after casting. Um, we have different casting parts on the motors. Then here on these, let's say, pre-production uh, systems, we still have machined, like this is a huge block that we are machining down to the housing and the cooling plate and so on. So it's very wasteful and very inefficient, but this will be stamped later, right? So there'll be lots of different manufacturing technologies to produce this. And I just think it's beautiful because like if something works good, it also should look good. If it doesn't look good, then probably there's something not so good engineered with it. So I just love the looks of it. Okay, so we have a lot of power here, but we need to cool it down. So we have uh, seven cooling systems, uh, two refrigerant and five with coolant. And that means they also have uh, five radiators, two condensers, a lot of pumps, fans, and everything together to make it possible to cool it. Why do we have separate uh, cooling system for the inverter and for the motor? For inverter, we have a different cooling system from the motors because of the different uh, temperature levels. So inverter is working on the lower temperatures of the coolant, while motor can withstand higher temperatures. Also, the flows are different. So coolant, inverter needs more coolant flow, while motor needs less. So let's say if they were on the same circuit and the inverter goes up to 90 degrees, the motor goes up to 150, yes. 
you would be limiting the motor when the inverter reaches 90 while the motor could continue. Yes, to... so pretty much you would be uh, heating the coolant with the motor and in that way reducing the power of the inverter. The journey how we got here to this powertrain is very interesting actually. So the concept one was already an electric hypercar with four motors and all that stuff. And with the C2, we started from scratch. We didn't take anything in common. Everything is designed for this car, no carryover. It was also a very different concept. Like for example, the rear axle of the C2 had the motors together. Then on the outside of the motors, it had uh, on each side a two-speed double clutch gearbox with actual carbon fiber clutches and so on. It was immensely complex, heavy, inefficient. I hated it, to be honest. I didn't like the fact that we couldn't achieve uh, the performance targets, the acceleration targets with a single speed, but you had to have a two speed. So when we started to develop the C2, I decided that we'll do it with the single speed gearbox. And I set some performance targets. Uh, I wanted to achieve 2.3 seconds, 0 to 100, and 350 kilometers per hour top speed with a single speed gearbox. We started to develop it. The powertrain, everything was laid out to achieve those targets. And then uh, just a few months before we were releasing the car, Tesla came out with the Roadster, with the new Roadster, claiming less than two seconds from zero to 100 and over 400 kilometers per hour top speed. And I was like, we can't be slower, we have to be faster. So we went back to the drawing board and before showing the car in Geneva, we were like working like crazy, you may might remember that Boris, to see if within the same package, because we couldn't change the suspension and everything around it, we had to fit like the only way to get to those numbers was to fit a two-speed gearbox within the space we had. So we went back to a two-speed gearbox. We did hundreds of simulations, different layouts, different concepts of gearboxes, super expensive uh, Formula One space grade materials to squeeze those gears and these shafts and everything into the space we had. And we managed to build a two-speed gearbox. And with the same powertrain, uh, with the same motors and inverter, we managed to get from 2.3 to less than 2 seconds, 0 to 100 kilometers per hour, and from 350 kilometers per hour to over 400. But the gearbox became super heavy. Again, we had two speeds, which I didn't like, and so on. So I really wanted to get rid of it, and we started from scratch again. Everybody in the company thought I was completely nuts to go again from scratch for the third time, but I thought, if we manage to get more torque in the motors and higher speed, we could get rid of the two-speed gearbox and still achieve the targets. So we again redesigned the complete gearbox and the motors, the inverter to a large degree as well. And we got the motor from 12,000 RPM to 17,700. And we got it from 700 Newton meters to 900 Newton meters. We got rid of the two-speed gearbox and we saved 60 kilos in the rear axle. Yeah. So that's the journey how we got to this axle. <laughs> I took up all of the time with my stories. Sorry, Boris, for that. We don't have time anymore to cover all the questions that you have sent for the powertrain. We will do that in another episode. Uh, Boris, thank you so much for being with us. And you guys, you have to tell us uh, any questions you have, and this time maybe an interesting question. You know that I started by converting an old BMW into an electric car. So tell us where you would put this one megawatt baby into um, any other vehicle, car, whatever. Uh, it's not anymore a V8 swap, maybe it will be an electric axle swap in the future. So tell us your most interesting ideas you have. And one more thing, of course, we are always looking for great people who want to join us. If you want to design and build stuff like this. So if you are interested in inverter development, hardware, software, gearbox, motor design and development, or the production process behind it, the production lines, the industrialization, please have a look at our careers page and join us.